For the Chinese, a thousand years is not a lot of time. Life does not gradually change over the centuries. Either it stays the same, or it changes very suddenly. History shows us that a people's way of life, the nature of their diet, their environment, and ultimately their diseases and deaths, evolves in the same manner as their country's political character. In the nations of the West, the past hundred years has seen a succession of revolutionary medical breakthroughs reflected in the general health of the populace. Typically for China, its revolution was late and all-encompassing. In China, this transition from a society which was dominated by the infectious diseases, the diseases of poverty, particularly in childhood, to a society where the main health problems are the chronic diseases of middle age, has taken place much more rapidly. Moving into the modern world may get rid of the old diseases, but it doesn't necessarily in make any big increase in the chronic diseases, but it's just if you're not dying of one thing, then you've got more chance of dying of something else. On the public health front, the revolution continues. And despite the ebb and flow of political tensions, the influence of the West on the traditional Chinese lifestyle increases daily. Change on such a scale creates some unique opportunities for study. In the 1970s, there was a systematic survey of who died of what all over China. And every disease that was common in one place was rare somewhere else. You could find one county where more than 10% of the men would die from liver cancer. Then you could go a few hundred miles away and you'd find that less than 1% of the men would die from liver cancer. You could do the same with cancer of the throat. You could do the same with having strokes, death from stroke. Every disease that is common in one place is rare somewhere else. And that means that all of the diseases that are common in China, at least the diseases of middle age that are common in China, are largely avoidable by some humanly practicable way of living. Now, when the first news of these differences reached the West, that was in the late 1970s, around about 1980, Chen, Chen Zhenzhou, was working with Colin Campbell at Cornell as one of the first Chinese scientists to come out and spend a few years in the West. Well, it really started in 1980 when uh, Dr. Chen came here to uh, do a sabbatic in, in my laboratory. And while he was here, we learned about this uh, very unusual atlas that the Chinese had just uh, completed. Uh, and so the first author of that atlas was in the United States at the time, Dr. Li Xinyao. And Dr. Chen knew Dr. Li, and in turn we invited Dr. Li here to chat about the atlas. And so at that point, we, it was quite clear that it would be a good place to do a study on the causes of cancer and other diseases. Only by this kind of collaboration, we can use, have the best use of the resources in China, for example. That's the field survey. And also use the best use of the resources in Cornell, for example. They have it as a center of coordination and a center of communication, so we can easily get access to the outside world, which in China, that's uh, too difficult. We cannot say impossible, but it's too difficult. Well, the, um, this remarkable work, which uh, Dr. Campbell uh, initiated, uh, really was making use of the fact that uh, China was the last medical frontier uh, to, uh, to cross and to where one could discover new things because large parts of China it was still quite unknown what the distribution of disease was. Its name, properly Zhangguo, means the country at the middle of the world. Vast, diverse and often isolated, it is more a world in itself. The reason for why we can conduct this kind of uh, type of survey very successfully and interested by many uh, foreign scientists all over the world is we have a big geographical different uh, variation, not only in uh, disease mortality, also in diet and lifestyle. And that's, I think that's the important point. Nowhere is the blend of modern and traditional ways of life more apparent than on the streets of Beijing. Bicycle travel, 
a financial necessity for most residents of all ages, is frequently pointed out as a primary reason for their fitness. But the main streets of the capital are wide enough for less genteel vehicles, and the skyline, with its proliferation of apartment buildings, is taking on the look of a decidedly occidental city, if one from an earlier decade. The open markets feature a wide variety of food choices, many of them quite nutritious, especially the grains and vegetables. Everything from fruit to cooking oil is purchased in bulk, and in summer the fresh selection is most impressive. In most Chinese cuisine, any possible monotony is countered by herbs and spices, which gain importance in less abundant seasons. Beijing, after all, means North Capital. In northern part of China, in the winter, there's uh, very little fresh vegetables available. But in Shanghai, there are all year round, you can have green vegetables. Shanghai, a few hundred miles to the south, is the center of China's culture and affluence. Here again, though the internal contrasts are more pointed, the street atmosphere is a mixture of eras. Shanghai's wealth stems from its importance as a seaport. What will happen once Hong Kong becomes a Chinese possession is an open question. But for now, Shanghai serves as China's New York City to Beijing's Washington, D.C. Its people have a long familiarity with Western standards of social status as well as some undesirable elements of Western life, such as pollution. Nonetheless, traditional activities abound. Any morning, in any weather, in any park, there is Tai Chi. Clearly, the urban Chinese take an active interest in fitness. But our concern is with established lifestyles, and to study that, it is necessary to leave the city. And in Shanghai, that's, uh, we excluded the Shanghai city, so in the go to the Shanghai, the, in the county of Shanghai. And we want to uh, find out what kind of uh, diet and the lifestyle characteristics are related to disease mortality. So we want the, the, the lifestyle and diet to be as simpler uh, as possible, and also there will be no interference from the other risk factors like air pollution or other chemicals, because in the rural area, the Chinese farmers lived in a very simplified uh, diet. And uh, the, all the foods are produced in the local uh, land and also the residential uh, the centers are very stable. They don't move uh, mostly. So 90 to 94 percent of our survey subjects were born in the county where, uh, where now they live and they're doing uh, farm work, and mostly not cereals and grains, mostly vegetables. And the vegetables, of course, they had a much higher price than the rice. So their income is relatively high. And uh, you can see the, and the, the, the food, uh, varieties of food and the eating habits, and they're all very different from the other parts of China. In Chinese cities, it is becoming a mark of social status to consume more meat. Rural Shanghai, where the stoves are still hand-fueled with twigs, is a different world, but it is clearly not a world deprived of the pleasures of eating.
This is also a Chinese landscape, the endless grassland of Inner Mongolia, beneath an astonishing sky where golden eagles still float in search of prey. The Mongolian nomads choose to live much as they did in the time of Genghis Khan, almost a thousand years ago. Every summer, each extended family leaves its winter home in the commune to live in the traditional Mongolian tents called yurts. And it is a life they choose, for they are among the wealthiest citizens of China. The source of that wealth also forms the center of their culture, their herds. In fact, pivotal to their entire lifestyle is the milk of horses. Inner Mongolia is a very special area, which is uh, very interesting. Their dietary patterns are uh, quite close to the Western diet. They eat a lot of mil meat and milk, which are very rare <laughs> in the other parts of uh, China, and uh, not very little vegetables, and uh, relatively low consumption of grains. So in the inner Mongolia, you will see they have very special food, like the homemade cheese. I don't know whether you could call it real cheese or not. It's homemade and it's fermented. The fermented milk separates into roughly three layers. The middle and bottom are mashed and divided into so-called sweet cheese and whey, from which are derived a variety of cheese products, including milk liquor. These slices, which at this point look relatively appetizing, are due for a few days of sun drying on the roof of the yurt. A typical serving plate will contain cheeses of differing consistencies and degrees of fermentation, soft and hard, sweet and sour. By the time the dried cheese is eaten, it will be hard enough to break a tooth. This, interestingly enough, is tea. The compressed tea bricks are another aspect of Mongolian life that has survived since antiquity. Milk tea is the nomad's basic beverage. To it, they might add either millet or any of the various cheeses. This is breakfast. And as exotic as it seems, it is closer nutritionally to, say, coffee and an omelet than to a typical breakfast in Beijing. Of course, their lifestyles are very different. They are on horses, not in cars, <laughs> not on buses. Sheep and goats, which are not differentiated, are the other main component of the nomadic lifestyle. The relationship between human and animal here is particularly striking. <laughs> the slaughter of a sheep has a ritualistic quality that could almost be described as Mongolian kosher.
To kill the animal, the herdsman first makes a small incision in its underbelly, then reaches into the body and breaks the aorta by hand. He waits as blood fills the cavity, for he will do nothing further until he is certain the sheep is dead. A surprising amount of the skinning does not even require a knife. Once the skin is removed, the rest of the family becomes involved in the process. No part of the animal will go to waste. What cannot be eaten will be put to another use. Every member of the family has a designated task, and each task is performed with skill and unmistakable pride. The best pieces of freshly butchered mutton are boiled at once. The fire is fueled by dried manure. Lesser cups can be cooked a variety of ways, combined, for example, with noodles. A dinner of meat this fresh may denote a special occasion, but mutton in some form is a part of the main meal almost every day. It is surprising to think that the lifestyle of a people who seem exotic even in their own country can have a bearing on our own. But it is just that uniqueness that makes the Mongols so important to the study. The first survey carried out in 1983 uh, included 65 counties, and we have uh, 100 household for each county. So that's almost uh, 10,000 people. Most of our nutrition information, uh, incidentally, in textbooks and, and so forth, uh, is uh, based on uh, using Western subjects by Western investigators. We haven't taken really into consideration uh, other societies where their dietary practices are rather different. And of course, they get different diseases. So China was a perfect place to uh, look at this, uh, in a sense, look at this contrast. In China, it's, it, may, it may be uh, much easier than in the, in the other countries. And uh, we have a quite um, perfect network uh, of the health institutions. So we. The institute organized uh, these uh, local health institutions, and uh, uh, they are very well organized. And we just provide uh, uh, technology and methodology for all the counties. We organized two training courses for each survey. Uh, we divided the provincial teams into two parts. One we call the southern part, so we have a training course in the southern part, and another. Uh, training course at the northern part of China. So the, each uh, training course took about uh, five days. We standardized our survey methodology and even the how to do the questionnaire survey. Uh, what the, will be the problems during the questionnaire survey? So we do all these, uh, we went over all these and do demonstrations and uh, the trainees, they did their practices during the training course. Then they go back, because it's not possible for all the 15 members of the provincial survey team to come to the training course. So they have to, they have to do their own training within their own provinces. Once training is completed, 
the provincial survey teams go into action. In the first survey, we, we have 24 provinces, so we have we had uh, 24 teams from the provincial level, from city level down to the county level. They are all professionals, and they will uh, recruit more interviews and uh, primary health care workers at the village level. The survey consists of various sample collections and questionnaires, such as this one for mothers of children under the age of three. Two communes or villages have been targeted in each of the 65 selected counties. This site in rural Shanghai is easily accessible. Others are not. Some of the northern nomads live four days by car from the nearest airport. In a country where flight delays can run half a day and a hundred mile drive between major cities takes four bone jarring hours, the accomplishments of the survey teams are astonishing. A question asked in Chinese must be translated into Mongolian for the young mother. With nutrition at the heart of the survey, one of the field workers' tasks is to record each household's complete diet for three days. In the rural Shanghai village, this involves weighing and measuring a lot of locally produced agricultural products. Food quality and variety are frequently problems in rural China. The lack of refrigeration means foods must be salted, dried, or pickled for preservation. In Mongolia, as we have seen, there are virtually no fresh vegetables and few grains. The survey team not only records the food, but also collects samples. An assortment of Mongolian cheeses, millet, and other fare will be shipped to overseas labs and checked for fiber content and possible toxic components such as heavy metals and pesticides. Important as it is, food is only one of the lifestyle factors under consideration. <laughs> This Shanghai mother will be asked about virtually every aspect of her daily life as part of an extremely detailed questionnaire. For each household in the study, the survey team collects information about the home and every person living in it. Every question has a purpose. Nothing is overlooked. Yeah. 
One important goal of the survey is to determine the effect of diet and lifestyle on the growth rate of the children, and ultimately to discover which growth rate appears to be the healthiest. This diverse set of ages, weights, and heights is recorded in every selected village to an equally wide range of reactions. Finally, blood and urine samples are collected from selected individual subjects in each village, 50 adults between the ages of 35 and 64. Because a reluctance to shed blood is a Chinese cultural trait, the researchers were initially unsure whether the subjects would permit them to draw the amount needed for all the planned analyses. Indeed, many of the subjects had never given blood before. It appears likely that the remarkable skills of the individual medical teams were a major factor in overcoming objections. In locations from which the blood cannot be quickly transported to a lab, the plasma is separated on site in generator-powered centrifuges. Urine containers are invariably a source of amusement. They are picked up the following day. All these field works uh, were finished within three to four months in both surveys. That's from September to December. And after they finished all the work, they, they do some preliminary processing of the blood and the urine samples um, in the field, in the, in the county lab. And they frozen it and send it directly to Beijing. Laboratory tests begin at the Academy of Preventive Medicine. The collected plasma, treated to preserve its various nutrients, must be divided up for a number of experiments. The plasma of the 25 men and 25 women in each village is first pooled according to sex. Then each of the two large pools is separated in varying proportions into 11 test tubes from which some 60 items of information will ultimately be derived for that village. This pooling scheme, a rather novel approach, permits a great range of statistical applications. Whenever possible, the testing is done in China. Here, a spectrometer determines the amount of vitamin C in each sample by measuring its reaction to a specific wavelength or color of light. Color, as we shall see, plays a part in many of the tests. This spectrometer is clearly of Western origin and testifies to the international nature of the entire study. To measure vitamins A and E and beta carotene, Dr. Wang Guanya uses a procedure she developed and perfected with colleagues at Cornell during a visit to the university in 1984. Here in Dr. Campbell's laboratory is the twin of Dr. Wang's machine in Beijing, a high performance liquid chromatograph, or HPLC. It is, as its name implies, a high-tech piece of lab equipment based on detecting colors and can be used at Cornell to analyze blood samples shipped from China. In this freezer are tubes of blood originally collected in Mongolian yurts, Shanghai farmhouses, and rural villages throughout China. Each will be subject to an identical set of tests many of them involving procedures similar to those of the high-performance liquid chromatograph. Consider the gas chromatograph used to measure fat content. The fatty acids have already been removed, dried, and suspended in a known amount of solvent. But to actually measure them, the solvent must be injected into the chromatograph.
As reflected in this time lapse, the acids are identified by their time of retention and detected by the energy they emit when they emerge. One set of samples is handled as though the donors were medical patients. At nearby Tompkins Community Hospital, the laboratory personnel subject the plasma to a series of routine chemical assays that check the level of a dozen common elements, such as potassium and sodium. It is difficult to believe that these little anonymous vials about to be inserted into a chemistry analyzer contain the same blood that was drawn in Chinese homes and pooled in a lab in Beijing. These are just some of the blood tests. There is an equally impressive array of analyses for the urine samples. In contrast to all this sophisticated technology are the fiber measurements performed manually on the grain and vegetable samples. In developing a procedure that has become the standard in its field, Dr. Peter Van Soest adapted some equipment owned by Cornell since the late 1800s. The food samples are mixed with acid and a special detergent and boiled for an hour to remove all soluble components. The mixture is then filtered and rinsed with water. From this point on, various components can be measured in the residue at each phase in the process. By the next day, the samples have dried out thoroughly, at which time they are weighed. After weighing, they will be treated with permanganate in order to obtain their levels of lignin and cellulose. Variations of this procedure can determine the amounts of a dozen specific components. And of course, it is only one of the many tests performed on the 600 food samples collected from every Chinese county participating in the survey. The responses to the study's myriad questions must be entered into a database. In Beijing, for example, raw data from the household questionnaires are first input at the Academy of Preventive Medicine's Computer and Statistics Department under the supervision of Dr. Wang Gonghao. Altogether, some 285 items of information ranging from biochemical indicators to smoking and drinking habits are recorded and sent to the ICRF Cancer Studies Unit at the University of Oxford. Here, where the expertise in statistics and data analysis is unsurpassed anywhere in the world, the survey results are forged into a comprehensive portrait of life in rural China. It's not in a sense an epidemiological study. It's the first step towards an epidemiological study. You can't really talk sense about a country until you know something about the patterns of death, the way they vary, and the patterns of lifestyle and the way they vary. Then you can answer some more structured questions. The cause of death component of the study began with the Atlas, published by the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences and the Chinese Cancer Institute. The statue representing cancer vanquished recalls the woman whom Premier Zhou Enlai, himself a victim of the disease, personally asked to be the Institute's first director, Madame Li Bing. Dr. Li mobilized 650,000 workers in the dark days of the Cultural Revolution, laying the groundwork for many of the studies that followed. That in China is a low and a only it's a clinical work in China for Ebola cancer. We put much attention to how to uh, get the reliable or completely information for the cause of death. And using a new uh, classification system, use an uh, international uh, classification of disease. Uh, in the case, my, my, much detail compared with study before. Information gleaned from the thousands of death certificates in Dr. Li Junyao's ongoing study becomes part of the Oxford database, there to be subject to the vigorous scrutiny of Dr. Jillian Boran, working with technicians Feng Zulin in China and Linda Youngman in the United States. Dr. Boram cross-checks and plots the mortality information along with the diet and lifestyle data, then formats all the survey's results for publication initially by the University of Oxford Press. 
For the Chinese, the resulting monograph represents 600 person years of professional labor supported by their own government. It locates and quantifies 82 diseases, 135 biochemical attributes of blood and urine, and 150 aspects of lifestyle, all expressed in 366 maps. We are very much interested in this project because the preliminary analysis of the data um, by Dr. Campbell and his colleagues at Cornell uh, tells us we are really in the period of disease transition. So we still have to face a big problem of infectious disease and uh, parasitic diseases. But now we are facing another problem, that's the diseases of affluence, so-called, and that's the cancer, heart disease, diabetes. If you look at the disease for the rich, then nutrition will be play, playing more important role in the prevention of disease of the rich. It's based on the lessons, its experiences from the foreign countries. In Oxford, quite near to the university, is a typically English market showcasing an impressive array of Britain's favorite foods. We in the West regard heart attacks as just a sort of normal thing. It's what happens when you get middle age. You have a heart attack, and I mean, maybe you can do something about it. But anyway, it's normal for the heart to degenerate. At least that's how we think about it. And it's not normal. And it's the Chinese experience that shows that it's not normal. In most parts of China, not up in the Mongol areas in the north, but in the Han areas in the south, people eat almost nothing from animals. It's almost all plant-based diet. The stuff you get in Chinese restaurants in the West is nothing like the stuff that Chinese peasants eat. That's Chinese court food, not Chinese peasant food. The Chinese peasants eat plants, and they have very little cholesterol in their blood, and they have far fewer heart attacks than the lowest risk that you would find in the West. As their income goes up, one of the first things I would expect is that they would uh, increase the animal protein part of their diet uh, rapidly. Is this your impression as well? Yes, unfortunately, uh -huh. it's uh, true. And it's also right. not only restricted to the peasants in the mm -hmm. rural areas, right. but in the urban areas. The urban population always also like mm -hmm. meat. So the Chinese saying is, uh, once you have uh, more money in your pocket, mm -hmm. you will buy more meat. For example, in the big cities like Beijing and Tianjin, the calorie contributed by fat is already more than 30 percent, which is exceeded the, the World Health Organization criteria. The another major Chen Junming is a graduate student at Oxford from Shanghai. His own research draws on the larger survey. Especially for this joke, as you know, in China and the risk of coronary heart disease is very low, but ironically, the, the stroke mortality is extremely high, and which account for 25 to 30 percent of total deaths in middle-aged population. And the, the real reason underlying the high mortality of stroke is not clearly known, except for the blood pressure, which is a very the primary risk factor of stroke. Another thing that I would like to mention is uh, nasophageal uh, cancer, MPC, very high in the south part of China, particularly in Guangdong, Guangxi uh, province. Their local people prefer a specific food, salty fish, so common. Uh, they uh, they uh, use this kind of food for baby and the whole life. So uh, right now, as uh, a hypothesis, maybe this is sort of fish uh, associated with nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It is very noticeable that the salt intake is extremely high in China, averaged from uh, 10 grams to 30, with average about 15, which is uh, twice as much as in British levels. Probably that will contribute to the high rate of hypertension and the high rate of stroke. Here in this country, we tend to freeze a lot of food in more or less a fresh state. There, without freezers, they are more required to use uh, salt procedures and these old-fashioned procedures to save the food over the winter. We have heard the Mongolian diet described as nutritionally similar to that of the West. 
But what of their diseases? They are high risk for certain type of uh, cancers, especially esophageal cancer. They do not use a unified uh, species or strains of molds. <laughs> and there are some uh, uh, very preliminary evidences show there might be some mutagenicity in these things. Well, they do tend to have more cancer. In fact, the one county of the 65 that was located up near the Xinjiang, Xinjiang border with, with the Soviet Union, uh, that particular group of people uh, had the richest animal foods diet, also had the highest rate of cancer of all 65 counties. So I think, think we can learn from them that there is no such thing as a normal Englishman. If, if, I mean, trying to say what's a normal cholesterol in America or England, it's, it's like taking lots and lots of people who all smoke cigarettes and then saying, well, what's a normal smoking habit? Well, I suppose you'd say a normal smoking habit is 15 or 20 cigarettes a day, but of course, really, a normal smoking habit is not smoking. You know, humans were not evolved to smoke cigarettes. Also at Oxford is the doctor who first links smoking to lung cancer and now sees trouble ahead for China, Sir Richard Dahl. Of course, uh, one uh, of the effects of the Chinese Revolution was that people were uh, promised the opportunity to be able to buy 20 cigarette, packets of cigarettes a day. Uh, and it was one of the things that was held out for them. And one can, there was no blame in doing that at the time because uh, at that time nobody had any idea how harmful cigarette smoking was. But uh, China is one of the countries where smoking has increased enormously in the last few years, uh, largely owing to the pressure, partly I think at any rate, to the pressures of the uh, advertising campaigns, people have been smoking very much more. In Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin, this uh, uh, big city already uh, changing as uh, the pattern, uh, cancer pattern changing. Uh, for the Tianjin, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, number one right now uh, would, would be the, the, the lip, uh, li uh, lung cancer now. And uh, strange enough, Shanghai has the highest lung cancer mortality um, in rural China. Of course, that's, that's excluded the, the, the city. But this, the county is around Shanghai, and obviously it's not much to do air pollution. So it must be related to uh, the one of the, 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 the ideas, it's not a really hypothesis, it could be related to some chronic respiratory disease. And that's, a, that's still a, a mystery, because what uh, Richard Pito is interested in uh, is the, what are the real causes of the chronic respiratory diseases in China, because that uh, accounts for 15% of the total deaths in China. Now, the one thing you do find out when you do any epidemiological survey is how you should have done it better. And so we've gone back and in the late 1980s, there's been a complete repeat of the mortality survey in the counties that we're studying. So that's getting more than a million causes of death sorted out. And there's been a survey of characteristics that's much more careful and that involves far more measurements than the previous one did, because now we know some of the things that we need to measure. Yeah, uh, in the second survey, we have seven questionnaires from the county level down to the individual level and the student level. And in, but in the first survey, we only had one questionnaire. So there are, there are many large aspects of the way in which people live in China which have been probably described for the first time in this study. And I suspect that in the long run, it will be those large aspects which turn out to be of greatest scientific value rather than the direct correlations between this, that, and the other disease, or between one disease and some characteristic of how people live. I mean, I think the best thing with any area of science is that some people think one thing, other people think something else. And if we all have different opinions, then at least we can't all be wrong. 
Could you kind of summarize maybe or give me an idea of what the, the most remarkable findings were uh, that come out of these um, publications over the past few years? I think the most remarkable finding is are all the findings in the aggregate, essentially. It's not any individual observation, uh, I think. Um, among these individual observations, though, there's a whole series of them that we've now considered. And that is to say that the higher the fat intake, the higher the breast cancer risk. Uh, the lower the fiber intake, the higher the, the cancer risk for colon cancer and rectal cancer. Uh, the lower the intake of beta carotene and, uh, and uh, vitamin C and uh, some of these antioxidants, the higher is the risk for uh, some of the cancers. Um, the lower the um, uh, intake of uh, animal protein, the lower the cholesterol level, the lower the intake of meat, the lower the cholesterol level. Uh, and of course, the lower the cholesterol level, the lower the, these various cancers. Uh, so, and, and in case of hormones, the lower the level of um, uh, animal food intake, if you will, uh, some parts of it at least, uh, the lower the circulating levels of estrogens, which in turn tend to be associated with a lower rate for breast cancer and maybe some of the other hormonally responsive cancers. Um, and so you can see from this, this simple collection of uh, observations that uh, it involves the hormonal system, it involves the uh, probably the immune system, it involves uh, enzyme mechanisms and all sorts of uh, ideas, you know, at the tissue level. But it does uh, cover the spectrum fairly well. A block away from Buckingham Palace are the London offices of the World Cancer Research Fund, one of several international organizations with an interest in the China project. The findings have confirmed what most scientists believe about the links between diet, lifestyle, and health. The next step, getting the message to the public, is at least as big a challenge. Good eating habits cannot be legislated. You know, the American Cancer Society, for example, for the last 20, 30 years has been launching uh, heavy campaigns against smoking, and only in the last five to 10 years have people really, the educated were first affected, and, and then it started to become a stigma. If you smoked, you then went to the back of the bus. Um, and I feel like that this is going to evolve in, in a similar way. I think the major difference between the dietary messages and the uh, smoking message is that the smoking message is very clear. I mean, everybody Granted, yeah. knows that uh, smoking that is, causes lung cancer and various other diseases. It's very well established. Whereas now the general public has got the impression that nutritionists in the medical world are um, undecided about the role of different factors of diet in, in disease. And that one week they come up with one idea, the next week it's another idea. The story seems to be fairly consistent based on our data. I mean, it, it definitely, the conclusion points towards a plant-based diet for, for optimal health. And I think that is one of the major findings that perhaps we should emphasize over here and expand on, perhaps in relation to breast cancer or colon cancer. Up until the 60s and 70s, the main emphasis was increasing protein and yeah. deficiency of protein. And although the ideas have changed in the developed countries now, in the developing countries, there's still this yeah. emphasis that people right. feel that they should be increasing their protein intake. Right. Mm. Right. I think it's so still there's a lag. Now, as a vegetarian, the commonest question I get asked by other people about vegetarianism is, how do you get enough protein? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. and that, although that's been out of date in nutritional <laughs> terms for about 20 years. But now we're getting the impression that the fastest rate of growth for children may not, in fact, be the best rate of growth. The time when uh, sexual maturity occurs in China is between 15 and 19 years of age. If one is, uh, m grows a little more slowly, but yet still has a, a, a good diet, good food, and a varied uh, uh, diet in the sense of having lots of different kinds of uh, plant foods, uh, the evidence suggests that the ultimate body size of these people are going to be about the same. And in fact, uh, athletically speaking, uh, a person is better off on this lighter fare, the, the more plant foods. The, the China study is impressive and fascinating for a number of reasons. And one is that it's looking at diet, lifestyle, and mortality as a whole. Yes. Now, the dietary guidelines that we're used to and young people have grown up with are dietary guidelines that were devised originally uh, in Europe and Australasia and America more or less at the same time uh, to try to reduce premature suffering and death from heart attacks. Right. And for reasons that seemed plausible at the time, that on the whole seemed to hold up. 
in the case of coronary heart disease, the focus is on fat and the focus is negative. So it's eat less and eat less fat and saturated fat. And as far as we can all see, that message is correct. However, the shift, and I think the shift has come with consideration of other diseases, whether that's other killer diseases like cancer or diseases that are disagreeable like obesity, uh, constipation, <coughs> tooth decay, or diseases that are disabling without being killers like, like diabetes, that the message now is broader and the broad consensus of scientific message has actually shifted the whole paradigm towards a positive message. So that the message now more and more, and I think this has been led by a lot of the work that's come out in cancer research, is not eat less fat, saturated fat, although that message still is there. Uh, but that's really the minor key message. The major message uh, is eat more vegetables and fruit. Uh, and I think if we can, if the scientific community chooses to rally around that message because they're convinced that it's soundly based in science, that's a message which is good news potentially for industry and good news for us all, because I think broadly, as a matter of common sense, we prefer to hear a message that, uh, that encourages us to do more of something than uh, a message that is discouraging us and is uh, telling us to do less of something. We could not prevent people from death. That's not our goal. It's, it's to prevent the death, the premature death, before the old age. The project continues. More surveys. Uh, now there's a survey, of course, in, in Taiwan, not just the survey in China, and we're working these in together. The central figure in this rare collaboration between mainland China and Taiwan is Dr. Wan Han Pan, a graduate student at Cornell in the early 1980s. When I returned to Taiwan and I found out about this study, I was really excited. In terms of, for instance, in terms of uh, serum cholesterol, it's very interesting. The um, average serum cholesterol in the United States somewhere around 2020. And in mainland China, I, I read some figures, it's, you know, 100 to 140 in that range. But in Taiwan, the, um, the data was somewhere around 170 to 210. It's just in the middle. The results of this massive study give the world scientists and policymakers the opportunity to view China as a vast living laboratory. So we have both Chinese scientists, Western scientists working together, and uh, that's our policy and our theme in a sense. It works very nicely because both sides have different experiences, different knowledge, put it together. We, both, we all learn, so it's a win-win situation. Of course, whether or not we take advantage of the situation remains to be seen.